Professor Weber, you may start. Please. Oh, I should start now. Oh, I thought I thought it was in 20 minutes. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I didn't realize I'd been introduced. Hello. Um, all right. Um, I want to talk a little bit. Um, they asked me to talk about human economies, which is a phrase that um, I actually originally developed in a book about anthropology. Um, noticing that that money is used very different ways in different uh, economies that anthropologists observe. There are places where money is used, as we do, primarily to get goods and services. Uh, there's also places where money is used mainly to rearrange social relations and you can't buy and sell anything, which is an idea which is extremely odd and unfamiliar to most people. Uh, so I decided to call these human economies, but in a, ver in a larger sense, it occurs to me that all economies are really human economies, and the strange thing about capitalism is that it's the only system that can make us forget this. Um, and I was particularly... Here, let me put on glasses and get this off. Um, there we go. Um, I was particularly struck by the confluence in, in, in thinking on this when I was in Rojava. I was there early December as part of an academic delegation. And um, at one point we were visiting a rehabilitation center for wounded YPG fighters uh, in the town of Amuda. And the co-director of the clinic, uh, this person named Agir Merdin, was describing his medical philosophy and the philosophy he felt lay behind the social order they were trying to build in Rojava. He said, well, you know, we have a basically preventative uh, idea of medicine. Um, you have to understand the prevalence of the most diseases. You have to first of all look at social factors. Um, so, um, since the body is part of nature but is also part of society, he said, the heart is sick, the body is too. He said, well, the most important factor, he said, um, in illness in modern society is stress. Um, Cities, he felt, really ought to be rebuilt with 70% green space, and then levels of stress would immediately decline, and with them rates of heart disease, yeah, that's a good idea, um, diabetes, um, even he was confident cancer rates. But he also insisted that it wasn't just about nature, it was about, so, uh, so, it was about social ties, that a lot of stress came from loneliness or social isolation. But that kind of isolation was engineered in modern societies as a mode of social control. I was very struck uh, by the way he put it. He said, well, we call this modern slavery because uh, in the past, slavery was imposed by swords, but in the contemporary world, in a way, we're even more primitive because at least in the past, uh, what slavery is is shearing people of all social connections except for the, their connection to the people whose person is giving them work. Um, in the past, that was done by capture and sale as slaves. It was done at the point of the sword, and slaves knew that they were slaves. Um, nowadays, we actually think that very, that very isolation which enslaves us is freedom. Um, that isolation, in turn, causes a terrible stress, and stress opens us up to disease. Um, so, he said, but to understand the health of the body, and the body in the sense, he said, as part of a web of social relations required a radical shift in perspectives about what society is actually about. Somewhat later after dinner, I remember, very, remember him while sort of meditating on a cigarette since doctors all smoke. David, please, yeah. a little bit slower. A little bit slower, okay. Because, yeah. um, after dinner, he was sort of meditating on a cigarette and he remarked, he said, after all, we always talk about production as if it's the production of things. Um, in any social system, what labor really produces is people. The most important form of production is always the production of human beings. And um, this really struck me because I'd actually, I'd actually written an entire book basically about that idea, um, a book called Towards an Anthropological Theory of Value, which Nobody ever read, certainly no one in Kurdistan. Um, so, you know, it, it, I got very excited by this, how, how these ideas sort of um, were converging. Um, 
I'd like to talk a little bit about that. Um, particularly, well, when I was writing about the production of people, and, and I was kind of coming out of a, a, a feminist reading of Marx, uh, it was inspired by feminist readings of Marx. Um, you could say that um, the essence of Marx's critique of capitalism, which most Marxists often forget, is, is precisely that, that it inverts our understanding of the importance of the production of people and the production of things. Um, at one point, Marx actually pointed this out. He said that if you look at the ancient world, no one ever wrote a book about what are the conditions that will create the most wealth. And that's interesting because, you know, nowadays that's the only thing you're really supposed to write about. Um, but in ancient authors, it just never occurred to them. Um, the obvious question to ask was what are the conditions that would create the best people? The kind of people you'd actually want to have as your neighbors, the kind of people who would go make good citizens, the kind of people who would make you know, the kind of people you want to have as friends. Um, so what are the social conditions that will create the best friends? Um, that was a reasonable question. And wealth was in turn a subordinate factor. You know, it was, it was something to be considered as part of that larger question. So you don't want to have too much wealth um, because then people become lazy and indolent and you don't want to have too little because then they're working all the time and can't be friends. Um, now, this is, and of course, then Marxists tend to forget this because um, a, a particular way that Marx's book is organized, it's, it's sort of, it's an internal critique of capitalist categories. Um, so that, um, you know, he adopts the terms that economists of his time used uh, and he's trying to demonstrate that even if you assume that Adam Smith, David Ricardo, all these other authors are right and um, markets really do work the way he says they do, it's all free labor, so forth and so on, you know, even if you grant the political economists their assumptions, you know, I can demonstrate that everything will still be contradictory and, and self-destruct. Now, since a lot of Marxists tend to treat Marx's work as if it were a sort of biblical scripture, they tend to forget that this is, this is an as if, um, and they actually take those, you know, since Marx said it, it has to be true, um, completely warp the, their perspectives. Um, you know, he didn't actually think that these things were true, and he certainly didn't think that they were, that perspective of capital that he was adopting in the book was good. Um, so there's a tendency to reproduce the categories unless you want to think them. And, and those become the dominant categories of our time. Um, I, I was just reading the paper the other day. Here's a quote. Um, In breaks between chopping vegetables, David Cameron told his interviewer that whilst he was obviously keen to be re-elected and to govern the world's sixth biggest economy until 2020, he would David, be seeking... David, a little bit slower, please. What's up? That was, that was fast? Okay. Uh, obviously keen to be re-elected <laughs> and to govern the world's sixth biggest economy till 2020, um, he would be seeking another term. Um, I just thought that was fascinating, the idea that um, what, here are some of the most powerful people of the, in the world, what do they think they're doing? They're governing the world's sixth biggest economy. That's what, like, England is. It's not a country. It's not a society. It's an economy. And the big question is, how big is your economy? You know, my economy is bigger than your economy. <laughs> the Chinese economy is going to beat the American one. English is going to beat France. Um, so that, you know, from the point of view of the people running the world, that's what matters, how big your economy is. Um, and it's fascinating because it creates kinds of political discourse that are just completely insane. Um, the, the greatest example I've ever seen of this is um, during the AIDS crisis in much of southern Africa. All of the, um, all of the health ministers, basically all government officials, now have to be trained by the World Bank in economic theory. So they're coming at this from the perspective of economists. And, and you'll hear people say things like, well, you know, it's a terrible problem that 
if we don't do something, um, half the population in 10 years will be dying of AIDS. And, you know, that's bad because it'll have terrible effects on the economy. <laughs> think about that, you know? I mean, um, it used to be that we used to think of the economy as the way that you keep people alive. You, know, you provide them with goods and services so they can flourish and thrive. So here we have, you know, we've got to the point where the best reason that you can come up with to think it's a bad, bad thing that everybody's going to be dead is that it will affect the overall production of goods and services. So in a way, the question that we have to ask, I think, is how did we get to the place where you know, that person can make that speech and not immediately be taken away in a straitjacket is completely insane. Um, since it is a form of structural insanity, the way that we talk about things. Um, now, one way of, of, of thinking about this, I think, is to look at, at how we talk about value. You know, you notice how when we talk about value, there, there's a kind of a, we talk about value and we talk about values. Um, and basically, we talk about value as economic value. Value is what happens in the economy when you're making things uh, to get money. Um, so, and, and Marx talks about this phenomenon. He says money has this bizarre double role because, on the one hand, money represents the value of your work. It represents the importance of your labor. But on the other hand, you do the labor to get the money, right? Um, so it's a symbol of something, but it's a symbol that in practice brings into being the thing that it symbolizes. Very interesting notion. Um, it's kind of a hall of mirrors where you know, work itself, what's important in life, the creation of society and the world around us, um, comes to be defined as that thing which you do to get money, even though money simply represents the importance of work. It reflexively defines what work is. Now, it, the other thing it does is it tells you what isn't work. <laughs> um, so, and that's where values comes in. When people start talking about values, family values, right? Politicians always talk about family values. But you also talk about religious values, political ideals, art, the value. Um, well, those are exactly the areas where labor is not commoditized, right? The major form of work that isn't paid is domestic work, so then everybody starts talking about family values, right? Um, so, so these are the things which we're not supposed to think of as labor at all, but of course they are. Um, and, and those values are, are values because they're unique. You know, money is a value, you can talk about value in the singular, because money can compare everything to everything else. But, you know, when you move to the domain of values where money, labor is not commoditized, well, then, in fact, each value is valuable because it can't be compared to anything else. So you can't come up with a formula, for example, for you know, how much it's legitimate to neglect your family in the pursuit of religion. I mean, people do it all the time, right? But you can't actually do it mathematically. Um, but on the other hand, you know, there, this is where that pernicious effect of taking capitalist categories and naturalizing them you know, is most pernicious because, you know, this, is, this whole domain in, in, in radical theory is sort of called, called reproductive labor. You know, it's, it's almost biological. It's, it's this thing which doesn't really produce value for capitalism, so it's secondary. What I'd like to suggest, and in a way this is following a little bit what Zilke said as well, um, that, that this, in fact, that's the primary form of labor. And what you do in a factory is secondary. The major form of labor and the most uh, a creation of real social value is, is a production of each other. Um, that, that we are ourselves projects of mutual creation. And, and we need to think of things in that way. Um, if you think about what's happening to capitalism today, financialization, um, you know, what they are doing is they're producing all of these incredibly complicated forms of value. And to some degree, it's just, it's just simply a sort of cover for military domination. I think it's very important that you know, the, the chief financial powers are always the chief military powers. Um, we, they want us to think that somehow 
countries in South America or Asia are, are sending things to Europe and North America and not getting much in return because they're somehow confused by the complexity of their financial instruments. And nobody's actually that dumb. Basically, it's a military shakedown. Um, but it's also a system of rent extraction. Essentially, Please, uh, David, yeah. a little bit slower. A little bit slower. Do it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Should I put pauses in between? Um, okay. What's well, a system of rent extraction? <laughs> um, and, and I think in two senses. Um, that, um, you know, on the one hand, what finance does is operate with state power to create debt. Um, and on the other hand, I think that the sort of forms of labor, you know, forms, domestic forms of labor, social production, if you want to call it that, is regulated, as feminists have long pointed out. And there's a million different forms of science, uh, you know, everything from domestic science to, to psychology. There's all about regulating and measuring um, and managing those forms of labor. Now, essentially what finance is doing is, is taking that and those forms of measurement and, and spreading it out to the entire society. So emotional labor sort of spreads out everywhere. You're supposed to be happy all the time when you work. <laughs> this is a key part of finance capital. Um, but. And, and as a result, I think that our old ways of talking about labor need to be reformulated. Um, now that we have capitalists are drawing rents and extracting from these new forms of, 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 of labor that have been created. Um, and I, one can think of it this way, um, that because that's what finance does. It, it takes all these things which had never been commoditized and comes up with mathematical formulas. I mean, it's about financialization, it's about the commoditization of love, of trust. I mean, that's what microcredit does. It takes family ties, um, forms of creativity, and figures out a way to stamp a, a price on them um, in a million different ways. Um, to actually think about this, we need to... I think reformulate our, our, our basic ideas about value. Um, and I would propose this. In the 19th century, there was a kind of conceptual revolution. I really believe that um, all revolutions are essentially moral transformations. They're, they take common sense and transform our basic political common sense. Our most fundamental ideas about what life, what politics, what an economy actually is. So when you have revolutionary moments, French Revolution, 1848, 1917, 1968, all of these were moments where basic assumptions changed. There was sort of global insurrection and there was a transformation of common sense that followed. Now, what happened in the 19th century was essentially the labor theory of value came to become popularly accepted as, as common sense. Now, everybody in the 19th century talked like we would think of as Marxists. We've seen speeches by Abraham Lincoln. He sounds like a Marxist. Um, and the idea that spread was that you know, it's labor, it's, uh, and they were thinking particularly of factory labor, or working class, um, construction of things, um, as the source of all that social value. The idea is that, you know, we came to, people came to realize, well, you know, the world is something we make. It's not something that just exists. Every day we get up and we create the world. Why can't we make it differently? I mean, it's a paradox, right? Because if we're all collectively making the world, 
why is it that we don't make a world that we particularly like? <laughs> Almost nobody actually likes, you know, even the ruling class don't really like it. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, that's the great paradox of, of, of leftist thought uh, as it emerged in the 19th century. You know, here we are collect collectively creating a world we don't like very much every day. I think um, John Holloway, who will be speaking later, sort of summed it up the best I've ever heard. Uh, he had the phrase, stop making capitalism. Um, it's actually going to be the title of his book, he called it something else. Um, and, you know, every day we wait, you know, capitalism doesn't exist. It's not this thing imposed on us. We make it. Um, we wake up every day and we make capitalism. Why can't we make something else? <laughs> um, you know, if we did just stop and make something else, then capitalism wouldn't be there. So, so what would it take to do that? That was the great revolutionary question. Um, is it proved remarkably difficult? In a way, all social theory is about that. You know, why can't we just wake up and make something else? Um, so, so the labor theory of value is one way of trying to come to terms with that, uh, a way of posing that question and also answering it. But it proved to be somewhat flawed. Um, and it's, I think it proved to be flawed because it fell into that very notion that what production is, is the production of things and not of people. Um, and as a result, you know, there's a paradox. I mean, I grew up in a working class family and that paradox was with us all the time. On the one hand, you know, labor was the source of all value. We were proud of working. On the other hand, we didn't really want to work. All. <laughs> I mean, work was something terribly imposed and, and miserable and degrading and alienating. How to reconcile those two points was always a constant paradox um, that we had to deal with. Now, as a result of, of, of the sort of strange view of labor that, that um, the labor theory of value implied, um, as a result of that, I think that a lot of revolutions sort of went off the rails or, or struck a terribly wrong direction. And it was possible for the other side to redefine the question. So very starting in the late 19th century, capitalists started promoting a notion that, no, value comes from the minds of brilliant entrepreneurs. <laughs> you know, and you're just doing the work. You know, you're just sort of, you're basically just a bunch of robots um, realizing their visions in the world. What you do is not important. Um, and that was pushed over and over again. And, and to the, well, of course, then they have to give you a reason why work is important. Uh, why should you be doing it at all? If it doesn't produce value. So the new line was, work is valuable in itself. It's moral. If, in fact, if you don't spend most of your time doing something you don't really like, you're not a good person. You know, bad people who either enjoy their work too much or don't do enough work are parasites. You know, they're, they're bad. You should resent them. They're stealing from you. Um, that idea, that idea has been incredibly effective. Um, it's probably the most insidious and effective notion that the capitalists have come up with. Because most people really believe that. Uh, that people who aren't working all the time at something unpleasant that they don't really enjoy, there's something wrong with them. Um, and as a, as a result, it come, it's created this bizarre inversion um, I've written about this myself in an essay called On the Phenomena of Bullshit Jobs. <laughs> it seems that, you know, the one thing capitalism isn't supposed to do, right, is to produce useless jobs. You know, the Soviets did that. But in fact, it happens all the time, right? I mean, half the jobs produced by capitalism don't do anything. <laughs> there are these guys sitting in offices, you know, playing with their computer all day pretending to work, and, and there's whole industries that are just useless, telemarketing, <laughs> you know, uh, human resource consultants and um, PR managers and uh, corporate law, you know, just get rid of all of them, the world would be a better place. Um, 
you know, we could all be working, you know, 50 and, you know. <laughs> Five minutes, that's fine. I'm getting toward the end. Um, yeah, I mean, we could get rid of all of these industries and all be working 15-hour days, right? But we're not. I mean, if there's ever a sign that our society is organized insanely and stupidly, you know, we're actually, you know, the fact, people are talking about the possibility that robots will replace um, lab human labor as a problem. <laughs> oh no, what are we gonna do when we don't have to work so much? <laughs> you know, if there's ever a sign that an economic system is crazy, it's like, you know, labor-saving devices are, are a problem. Um, so there's this bizarre inversion, right? Um, in our society, not only are there useless jobs, but the more useful your work is, the less they pay you. How does that happen, you know? <laughs> because if you think about it, like most of the low-paid jobs are jobs that are actually necessary. You know, you need to have nurses. If we didn't, we'd be in trouble fast, right? We need to have garbage collectors. We need to have uh, drivers. You know, I mean, our society requires these things. If they were to all vanish, we'd immediately suffer. You know, if all telemarketers vanished, the world would be a better place. Uh, <laughs> you know, if all, like, uh, financial CEOs would vanish, the world would be a much better place. <laughs> So, so, you know, there's an inverse relationship between how much actual value your work produces and how much money you get to do it. You know, jobs that subtract value from the world are actually the highest paid of all. Um, and, and, but the strange thing, and this is the terrible thing about our current economic system, is that it teaches people to think that's right. And this is why, why that idea that work is valuable in itself, and unpleasant work especially. You know, there's this idea that if your work actually produces something, then you're getting something out of your job and you shouldn't be paid as much. Now, this is true. I mean, people think this. Um, there's this terrible resentment against teachers in America. You know, why? Teachers is a necessary job, right? Uh, but in a way, there seems to be the sense of teachers shouldn't be paid well. They shouldn't have benefits because they get to do something useful. You know, they teach kids, or people make cars, and then they want benefits too, you know? Um, and and that, that works. So this is a sign of this sort of bizarre inverted perversion of our, of our system of, of um, economic logic. So how do we get away from that? Um, I think that we need to completely reverse our perspective. And this is what I mean by, by moral transformations. Um, I think we need to start by looking at um, how, or well, start by redefining almost all the terms that we're used to using. For example, one, one thing that I always throw out is uh, the word communism, right? Um, we're used to thinking of communism as a economic, total economic system which has something to do with collective property. I think this is just wrong. Um, I think we need to think of communism as any so social relation which is based on from each according to their abilities to each according to their needs, right? That's the principle of communism. Well, if you think about it, almost all work is organized communistically on the ground level. If I'm working for a capitalist firm and I'm fixing a pipe, right, um, I say, hand me the wrench. Other guy doesn't say, yeah, what do I get for that? <laughs> you know, you operate communistically according, from each according to their abilities to each according to their needs. Why? Because it's the only thing that works. You know, communism is actually the most effective way to cooperate, to allocate resources. So, uh, in a way, I think that capitalism is just a bad way of organizing communism. <laughs> we need to find a better way of organizing communism. <laughs> So most social relations are already based on communism. Um, you just need to sort of expand it a little bit. Um, and all, you know, society is based on a sort of fundamental relation of communism. If the cost is small enough, you know, do you have a light? If the need is great enough, I'm drowning. Um, then, of course, you act communistically from each according to their abilities to each according to their needs. And, and caring relations are entirely based on that communistic principle. So I think what we need to do, first of all, is, uh, 
you know, we've had a, one moral transformation, I think, already. I think in 2011, we had a revolutionary moment with what the revolutions that swept the world starting in, in Tunisia and Egypt, Spain, Greece, then with the Occupy movement spread all over the world. And those were violently put down. But ever since, when radical democratic movements begin, they, don't, they no longer see, seek to seize state power. Um, there's been a fundamental change in our very conception of what a democratic social movement is. And this is what we've seen in Rojava as well. Um, there's a moral transformation. It's a transformation of our basic political categories, which is what a revolution really is. But I think in order to go further with this, we need to change our basic categories of what labor is. It's just as in the 19th century, the idea of the labor theory of value as production, material production, was incredibly effective, although it turned out to have very real limits, which allowed it to be reversed, we need to like, change our conceptions of labor to one that starts from caring labor. Now, what society is, is a process of the mutual creation of human beings. It's not just the creation of the material world, it's the creation of each other. That's what we're doing. That's what you know, we're doing right now here. You know, caring, education are the primary things. There's an education, move, free education movement in right now um, in Amsterdam and London. There's a huge student movement emerging. I find this very exciting. Um, and one of the first things that they're putting in their plank is that you know, we've been told that the purpose of education is to improve the economy. This is backwards. The purpose of the economy should be to improve education. You know, to give people the freedom and leisure to understand the world, to learn things. You know, our, our, our perspectives are totally backwards. Um, and I think that's true if you take education as part of that broader process of caring, of mutual nurture, of mutual support that creates the world by which we create each other. So, so uh, I think that, that if we begin to re look at the world that way, and of course that's the way that most people who've ever lived did see the world. You know, most societies, it's just assumed that material production, the production of iPhones and glasses and, you know, material objects is just one subordinate moment in a broader process by which we create each other, of creating people. Um, thus, you know, factory labor is a form of caring labor if the stuff you're producing in the factory is things that people care about, people need. Um, but it's a sort of second order form. It's, all, it's things that are useful in what's the really primary business of human life, which is our taking care of each other. Um, and I think that, that if we do that, if we transform our categories and begin to rethink the world in that and make that common sense, then we'll truly have achieved a revolution. Thank you.